But in reality, I think it's this country's problem. Even yes. People, when do we get taught finances? When do we get taught how to really manage a, 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 a checkbook? How to do taxes? None of us know all this stuff, and yet we're from here and we speak the language, but schools mm. don't teach us this stuff. So it adds to the fact that it doesn't really matter where you came from or what you look like. This it, It's not being taught anywhere. And those that make it, make it and have really hard knocks, but mm -hmm. they learn. And so I've noticed that it's, it, it's common amongst communities, amongst people that we just don't know finances. We're scared of taxes. And if we're scared of them, we just don't, we don't want to look at them until they're due. And we're <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So what do we do? We hurt ourselves. So I think that this, this tax system is broken. Hello, and welcome back to Journey of a Fearless Female. I am your host, Paola Rosser. This week, my guest is Hu Hei. She is the co-founder of Prominence Business and Wealth Management. She supports hiring self-based business owners, achieve long-term wealth through holistic approach to financial services, providing bookkeeping, tax preparation, financial planning, and tax strategy under one roof. Together with her two sisters, co-founders, Sugi, runs the business and also hosts and produces Tax Talk and Hey Hey Podcast, where they provide insights into business taxes, wealth building, and what it means to really create financial freedom. Besides her own show, Sugi has also been featured on Sell Without Selling and Business Spotlight USA. Everybody, please welcome Sugi. <laughs> so good to have you on the show. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Um, I was telling her before the show started is that we have something in common. We're both first generation Mexican American. And so um, I love giving other Latinas a place to speak their story. <laughs> so let's talk about your journey as a fearless female. Um, let's go back. Where did this all begin before you started doing what you're doing today? Yes, of course. Um, you know, well, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for having me here. Um, you know, gosh, it, it, it something that I want to point out is I didn't know that I had a story, right? I, you, you grow up and you think that this is life or this is normal or, you know, you know, we didn't, con I didn't consider myself like boohoo boo me, right? I thought I had a great upbringing, but as you start to really look at things, um, you know, and look at other families and other, just to compare yourself, which I really hardly ever did. Um, you start to realize that, man, as the oldest of five, we're five girls. Mm. Um, and my parents, you know, you know, came to this country not knowing the language. Um, you know, man, I think of the, all of the things that I've accomplished. And hey, I'm going to pat myself on the back for that, right? It's, yes. it's, it's been a struggle, but I didn't look at it that way. Um, it's, we've had a very beautiful life. And I am the five of old, uh, five girls. And I love, and we have a very close relationship with my sisters, um, very blessed in, um, in the fact that, you know, we, we get along and my parents, my dad make a, made us grow up loving each other. So that's a plus right there. So much so that, you know, we co-founded this business between, uh, you know, two of my other sisters and I, and so now this business really supports us all in one way or another nice so it's nice it's it's really a blessing that um that it, it's a blessing in disguise because we didn't know how fortunate we were to be able to all be able to run a branch of the office of the of the office and make it bloom um but going back to you know when I was very little uh, and I always say it's right around the age of 12 or 13 but I know I was younger when my dad would ask me to translate documents for him, right? Mm. It's because I started kindergarten. I knew now a little bit of English. Um, he expected me to know how to refinance a house or, <laughs> you know, buy a car or something, right? And I'm yeah. sure there's a lot of, of uh, first gens out there that relate to that. Um, yes. But it made me very um, also knowledgeable. Uh, I know a lot of a little, you know, a little bit of a lot of things. I mean, mm -hmm. not an expert in everything. But some at some point in my life, I must have translated a document. I must have replaced an engine in a car. I must have, you know, <laughs> gone to the pharmacy, just done something to translate and help my parents. Yeah. Uh, and then as the other sisters came along, well, it got easier because I was the one, the oldest. And so I should know and I should help. And so it just becomes one of those things where 
Um, I didn't know how hard it was, but now that I have my spoiled kids, I'm like, damn, you guys don't have enough, you know, you don't even know how to balance a checkbook. Do you know that at 13, I know how to balance a checkbook? Right. It's so, <laughs> it's such a different existence. Uh, go back a little bit. So you said you're number five or you're the first of five. I'm the first of five. Oh, well, I'm the, the I'm the seventh <laughs> of six. <laughs> well, only six survived, but I remember sitting on my dad's lap and having to order McDonald's because he couldn't read the menu, yeah. you know? <laughs> and I, I remember that. And it's funny now, like how you said your kids are spoiled. Like my stepson, he's always like, come here, come here. Can you order for me? Or can you tell them? And it's just like, or you know what you want from Canes, just like order it. <laughs> She's not going to bite you, you know, but it, it does give you that sense of confidence in yourself. Like I'm the first generation here. I have all my other sister, me and my other sister were anchor babies. Mm -hmm. And so my other sisters, um, had the, like the accent, you know, the beautiful Selena, uh, you know, Selma <laughs> Hayek accent. Um, and I remember my dad would tell me like, don't pick up that accent. Like yeah. you want to have absolutely no accent because people will respect you more. Yeah. And, um, I didn't even think of it back then, but yeah. now looking back and reflecting and I see like my sisters being treated differently. I see, yeah. you know, how different they, they are looked upon, even though they have their master's degree, they're so yeah. like, all of them are so super smart, but just the, you know, the racial implications of right. having an accent or having, you know, a different skin tone skin tone. Like my dad used to tell me not to sit, sit in the sun for too long. Cause he didn't want to be a dark Mexican, <laughs> but yeah, these are the things that you, like you said earlier, you don't think of them as like, I had adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. You think of them as that was life. Yeah. And for a long time, I mean, my dad was, is, and you know, a really hard worker. So he just taught us all how to work. And so I never, you know, want to say, Oh, boohoo me. Right. But as life goes on, you start to realize certain things and people make certain comments. Like I have a very oriental look. People think I'm Filipino or I'm Hawaiian or something. And because I don't have that accent, they really don't know who they're talking to on the phone until they meet me. And they'll be like, oh, and you know, uh, are you Filipina? And and I'm they're like, and I'm like, no, I'm Hispanic, I'm Mexican. And they'll be like, oh, you don't have an accent. And so you start to realize that people judge or make think, make these comments and you're like, should I have an accent? Like, why <laughs> you, I don't get it, you know? Yeah, people tell me that too. Well, I'll talk on the phone and they're like, so you're Mexican? I'm like, yeah, well, you don't sound Mexican. Well, how does a Mexican sound? <laughs> Like, am I supposed to say like my vato? <laughs> like, what am I supposed to say to like make you believe that I'm Mexican? <laughs> That's what I then I question myself and I'm like, well, what do I sound like then? You know, but and things that I really never thought of. Um, and again, I think it has to do with where we were raised. My my dad took us out from. He never wanted us to come up in um like down. I'm from California, so downtown Los Angeles, like you mm -hmm. know he wanted us to have a better upbringing. So he took us out into the, you know, into a city outskirts and um, growing up, most of our neighbors were white, you know? And so um, I didn't realize what he was doing. He never took us back to Mexico. Um, he always said that uh, he, he, that we were going to be uncomfortable because mm. when he comes from, um, there wasn't like a toilet, there was an outhouse or, you know, it's a ranch. And he would, he would paint this picture of, a place we didn't even want to visit ourselves, you know? Yeah. Um, and then as we grew up and we'd visit Mexico for other reasons, believe me, not because he took us back, but it'd be like, dad, it's like so amazing to go and, you know, experience how beautiful these places are. But he, because of the picture he painted, we didn't think we wanted to. And yet now we always tell him, dad, you should have like, you know, my friends would go for like the summer or something, holidays or something. And they would all love going back to where their parents were from, but not us. My dad didn't think that we would like it. And now that's one thing we tell him, man, dad, we missed out on going back um, and visiting where you were from, you know, but. Yeah. So growing up, did you speak both languages or did you go to like English as a second language classes or how did that happen in your education? So I'm 40, I just turned 46, gosh. Um, so when I was in the school district that I was at, because it was mostly white kids, um, not necessarily all, but a majority of them, we didn't have those special classes where they teach you uh, English um, as a second language. 
So my first language is Spanish. I speak very fluent Spanish. Um, and so when I started kindergarten, I got held back because the only instructor in the school was a kindergarten instructor. And therefore she, they held me back a year so that I could communicate with somebody because everyone else in the school spoke plain English and I couldn't communicate with anyone else. So I had to learn English really fast or else I would still be in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, let's get you up to speed. Cause and isn't yeah. it crazy how, um, you know, we're the only country that is like, you have to speak our language. Yeah. You know, you go to another country and they speak English so that they mm -hmm. can communicate with you. Like kids are taught at a young age in China and like yeah. other countries in Africa to learn how to speak English so that they can communicate with you. And here we're like, no, you have yeah. to learn our language in order for us to communicate with you. Yeah. Um, and that was like a real struggle for my parents um, because it was hard for them to go. And, and now, like, I think back you know, when I was younger, I would get really frustrated with my mom and dad and be like, why, why can't you just figure this out? Like, why yeah. am I doing my elementary school math and then having to stop, like you said, and read a contract yeah. um, to, to help you out? Why can't you figure it out on your own? And now I look back and I have so much more grace for my parents right. because it's like, I can't imagine being placed in a different country and not knowing the language, not being able to read a sign, yeah. not being able, and then trying to like conduct business. Right. No, I mean, I'm very proud, but uh, you know, obviously at this age, I'm very proud of the accomplishments that my parents, you know, have done, you know, having their own house, you know, being able to retire at a really young age, having you know, it's just they're, they're, they live such a humble life. And so I love that about them. Like going home is nice because it's like going out of town and being and it things just calming down because, you know, your parents got you, even though it's plain and simple and maybe frijoles is all they have, but <laughs> man, are they so good, right? Yeah, it, exactly. So it's like, it's nice. Yeah. Um, but we've complicated our lives. We've obviously done the American thing and, you know, we're uh, running this business now, which my parents are very proud of, but it does complicate things. Yeah. Uh, it's the hustle and bustle um, idea mindset that we have. And sometimes I wish we would just settle for, you know, some rice and beans on the plate and be like, hey, this is good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So better, let's go back to before. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back to before you started the business, because like, you know, having a business, not only um, within itself, but to run it with your two sisters, because um, I come with, you know, I'm one of six and three of my sisters work at the same school. And I could hear, I always hear <laughs> what, them bickering because of this and that and all this other stuff. But it's like, it is like a, you know, another layer to owning a business with somebody that you that's your relative, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So how did that come about? And how did you guys decide to like create this business? Were you guys working other corporate jobs and then decided I want to do it on my own? So, you know, it's the three oldest. So yes, in a sense, um, again, I, you know, we were, we were taught to hustle and bustle. So I got my first job at 15 and a half and um, my dad didn't really let us explore. So we would always stay within the four corners of our city. Like, you know, we would eat at the same places every month. We would, you know, our, our life was very routine based. Like we wouldn't, you know, explore outside of that. And so my first job was at a restaurant. I worked at El Pollo Loco because we would eat there, you know, every other month or whatever. And so that was the only place I really knew. And so I applied there and I got the job. Um, well, once I got the job, uh, you know, shortly after when my sister turned of age, she did this kind of the same thing. She started working like at KFC. And so everything was within our city. Like, I'm not kidding, like two, three blocks away from our house. That's where we kind of worked. Mm -hmm. um, but I got a job at like a hotel being the receptionist. It was a little motel down the street. And so I brought, instead of my sister working at KFC, I said, hey, why don't you come work with me? They, they need another receptionist. And she's like, okay. So she came to work with me. And then I worked, um, you know, I graduated high school and I started to work at a CPA firm and as a receptionist and um, they needed more help. And so I brought my sister over to work with me as a receptionist. And we learned accounting, we learned the tax world. By that time, the third sister was ready to start working. And so, you know, we kind of like pulled each other always to the same places. There was a, a gap of around 10 years where we all kind of went our own ways. 
Uh but still in the accounting world. Like um, Brisa worked as an accounts payable. Cruz was a bookkeeper for a firm. And I was a a tax strategist for another firm. So we were in different places, but still within the accounting world. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when we are celebrating my youngest sister, which she's 19, we're 19 years apart. We're celebrating her 21st birthday in Vegas, you know, in a jacuzzi, having a glass of wine. We start talking about just, how blessed we are in our dreams and all this stuff. And then one of them's like, when are you going to start your business? So, Hey, like you always say like one day, like, when is this one day going to come? And so I was like, well, when I get this other license, when I get my degree, when I get this. And so it was not, I always felt not enough, you know, even though by that time I had a following, I had my aunt and uncle and the neighbor and friends and coworkers. I was already doing their taxes over my kitchen table yeah. But I just didn't feel brave enough to take that leap of quitting my job and opening my business. It was just something that one day I would do, but I was scared. I mean, it's it's a big leap. Yeah. But Cruz, which is the second oldest, she's like, well, if you do it, I'll do it with you and we can do it together. And so that I felt better, right? Because mm-hmm. now I had like my, even though she's my younger sister, I feel like she's my older sister. She's very, like I tell her she's fearless and brave. Mm. and we did it together we did it together and then within six months of us opening the business we had so much clientele that we needed another sister to join the team and that's wow join the team so we've had the business for a little over five years and brisa has been with us you know um right right from the beginning a little bit after um but it's been great it's been um it's been very nice to get to know each other and uh like notice our drives we we all have a place like I'm the dreamer I'm the visionary you know I love doing stuff like this meeting other people um Cruz is like just tell me what to do and I'll just do it and (laughs) Risa's organizing everything and she manages all this other stuff for me so it's it's nice we 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 complement each other very well that's good. That's good to hear. Cause my sisters are always like, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? I'm like, why do you guys just work at a different school? So you don't argue every day, but they're my sisters. And I'm just like, we love and hate each other at the same love time. love and hate each other at the same time. Yeah. I exactly. always say, what do I need other enemies for when I have my sisters? They're like blunt and tell me, Hey, your hair looks horrible today. It's like, thanks. You know? <laughs> I know my sisters used to tell me, you don't need friends. You have us. And I'm like, yeah. I don't want to hang out with you guys all the time. <laughs> They're also like 10 years older than me. So it's like, okay, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's funny when I'm not with them, I'm talking about them. So it's like, might as well just hang out with you guys because all I do is talk about you guys anyways. They'll be like, yeah. how sisters do you have? I'm like, I have four sisters, but yeah. yeah. So it's nice. But how fortunate it was for you to fall into this line of work because yeah. um, my father, you know, like I said, was here and he didn't, he started a business and he didn't know anything about taxes. Yeah. And so I remember we had our house repossessed Mm -hmm. and it was like, what, what's going on? And, you know, and it was like, oh, he hasn't paid his taxes and we haven't paid property taxes and the mortgages behind. It was like all these things that were happening to us financially because my father was unaware, you know, unaware of things. Um, Not that he was purposely not doing stuff. He just was unaware of how to like keep track of his business because it wasn't like that in Mexico like he he we also went well not me because I didn't wasn't born never went to Mexico but they would tell me about how they lived in like a little shack with an outhouse as a bathroom so like things that our government does is completely different from what was happening down there especially back in the 50s and 60s you know so it's like he had no clue how to do your do their taxes and I feel like you know, that's a huge part of what our community needs is more financial literacy. Like it's crazy when I go to the bank, because I used to work at the bank and I go to the bank all the time to do stuff for, you know, my business, my husband's business. And like the other day, um, this lady was beside me. She's, she looked like a little lady, um, you know, a person of color. And she was like, how much do I have in my saving? And I kind of like overheard. And she's <laughs> like, she had $78,000 in her regular savings account at Wells Fargo. And I'm just <laughs> kind of like, have you heard of a high yield savings account? But I didn't want to tell her anything because yeah. obviously I'm overstepping my boundary by listening to the conversation. <laughs> but there's so many things that, you know, I feel like 
the community doesn't know, or they're yeah. too afraid. They're too afraid to put their money in high yield savings accounts. They're too afraid to make investments. They're right. too afraid that someone is taking advantage of them. And our community has been taken advantage of by different people and different organizations. And so, I mean, how would you like talk to someone who has had, has been burned financially yeah. by the system and how do you help them unravel their financial mess. Yeah. Well, there's definitely a lot more, a lot more emotional scars there and stuff like that, that, you know, we have to battle and go through. Right. But one thing that I, you know, you just said, and, you know, this person didn't look like a person that had $78,000 in their bank. Right. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I feel so bad that our community or our humble upbringing didn't take advantage of. Right. Um, because they're so good about managing their money. Mm -hmm. And yet we stuff it in a mattress because we don't know any better. So yeah. I always tell my clients, I can care less how much money you make because I've been in front of extremely, you know, people, extremely rich people that make a lot of money, but are yet are up to their noses in debt, have an elaborate house, have elaborate cars, things are being foreclosed on them because they don't know how to manage their money. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've been in front of people that make $70,000 a year, but yet have all these rental properties. Yeah. It, it, it's just, you know, what has held us back is obviously not knowing the language, right? Not being financially educated, but also is the fact that we have that fear and mm -hmm. we just don't know. So people take advantage of these people that don't know any better or don't have maybe the, you know, the, the savviness of knowing how these accounts work. And so when you hear of those stories, well, then everybody would rather stuff their money in a mattress because that's safer than investing it or putting it to work somewhere because they know where that money is at yet they're yeah. losing on that, on those opportunities. But I see it all the time. And I always tell people, it's really not about how much money you make. It's about what you do with your money that really matters. Yeah. Um, and we all can do it. Um, but that was the other thing that I've noticed that it, you know, I thought it was because my parents were immigrants because my parents didn't speak the language that they didn't have an educational, fi you know, fi financial background that they didn't know. But in reality, I think it's this country's problem. Even yes. people, when do we get taught finances? When do we get taught how to really manage a, a, a checkbook, how to do taxes? None of us know all this stuff. And yet we're from here and we speak the language, but schools mm -hmm. don't teach us this stuff. So it adds to the fact that it doesn't really matter where you came from or what you look like. This it, It's not being taught anywhere. And those that make it, make it and have really hard knocks, but mm -hmm. they learn. And so I've noticed that it's it, it's common amongst communities, amongst people that we just don't know finances. We're scared of taxes. And if we're scared of them, we just don't, we don't want to look at them until they're due. And we're, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So what do we do? We hurt ourselves. So I think that this, this tax system is broken. The oh, absolutely. System, I mean, you no. Know? preach sister. Cause I, I literally, I was just telling my husband the other day, I was like, I don't understand how we're taxed when the money is given to us what? taxed when the money is spent taxed again. Like even yeah. when they gave everybody the COVID like money, right. Oh, it's free money. No, you're going to get taxed on that too. <laughs> in addition to, but like you said, we didn't get the education at school. Like I have my bachelor's degree. Like I went to school in a white neighborhood and I, you know, got my bachelor's degree at a nice college. I was never taught how to keep a good credit score, how to apply for a loan, how to start a business, how to manage my p and I didn't right. even know what p and meant. I didn't even know what <laughs> ROI meant. I had to learn like in the school of hard knocks. Right. Like I had to read books outside of school to right. teach me how to create financial security, Right. which is like, why isn't this being taught at school? No, they're teaching me like about dinosaurs that don't exist. They're teaching right. me about statistical math that I'll never use in my life. And it's like, why don't they have these educational programs, especially for the younger population? Like right. they don't understand they're setting their own self up for failure yes. because we need our, like everybody in the community to be successful because then otherwise we're all falling short. It's a ripple effect. It is. 
And that led us to change our, our firm. So we started as tax preparers and now we're tax advisors. So we changed because I kept seeing the client come in year after year making the same mistakes. And I'm like, wait a minute, if you would have just done this, we could have shifted all these numbers to your benefit. Mm -hmm. And so, but they're like, well, no one ever told me that. And so I'll do it. And so then I started to notice that if people are given homework that benefits them, because remember, how is that benefiting me? If you get a bigger refund or if you pay less taxes, like I don't get more money in my pocket, it's to your benefit. That's where the wealth building began because I started to see that if you help people understand their finances, their numbers, and have them do one or two shifts, and if there's a there's a return for them, they could turn around and make more money with that by buying assets or you know doing other things, getting out of debt, figuring other ways. And so I realized really fast that it really is our system that's broken. I thought it was because I was Latina, because my parents didn't know and they didn't teach me. But you realize that hundreds of people walk in through your, you know, to do their taxes and none of them know what those forms are saying. None no. of them know what those numbers mean. And the minute I'd be like, oh, look how much money you made. They'll be like, I made that money. Where did yeah. I go? And it's so, the people that are like, even the most educated doctors, lawyers, you know, matter. they, they're like, wait a minute, what they're, they, like you said, they're so afraid of it that they're just like, here's my paperwork. I can't, I was just telling her before the podcast that I was trying to do my own taxes. And I was like, I can't figure this out. And I ended up after a month, like just giving up and paying someone else to do it. And, you yeah. know, it's such, it's such a great, we all have to pay taxes. Right. So it's such a great thing. If you can create the knowledge. Yeah, you know, and learn to like, really, you know, help yourself yeah. financially. So the good thing that we've noticed is since we shifted from that, just the tax preparation um, to a tax advisor, we noticed that even our clients are more excited to come see us instead of dreading our appointment. They're looking forward to our appointment because they already know what their numbers look like. We've already estimated all this stuff projected. And so they want to know whether they beat Uncle Sam or not, kind of. Right? <laughs> a, yeah. So yeah, so just like you smiled and you laughed, it's like they come in and they're like, okay, how did we do, you know? And so it's exciting to see that people are, are shift that, that we could shift it with just a little bit of more, you know, explanation and understanding of our numbers that you could shift that. And that's my goal. That's my mission. It's been to be like, you know what? Uncle Sam is not that bad. It's just, we don't know how to utilize the IRS code to our benefit because no one has ever taught us how to. And so that's, you know, really my message is we could do more with, it doesn't matter how much money you make, you know, we can make a difference and we can make a shift if we know how to read and study our own numbers. Yes. I love that. Um, there was a guy, I forgot his name. I can't think of his name right now, but he would say, how could you play the game without knowing the scoreboard? Yeah. Like, how are you supposed to, and a lot of us are not in the game because we bury our head in the sand. And a lot of people have that old ideology that math is so hard and numbers <laughs> are so complicated. And so then we just bury our head in the sand and we hope and pray for the best. When right. in reality, we should just face the monster that is the tax guy yeah. and just like find people like Suhey, who's done the work and the research and has all the knowledge, the plethora of information and numbers don't scare her yeah. and, you know, find someone that's going to help you go to the next level. That's one thing that like, I always, I do a lot of research of people who win the lotto. Cause one day I'm going to win the lotto. <laughs> <laughs> and I always think about like the, the people that don't know what to do, they have this windfall of money. And because they have a windfall of money, they don't know what to do and they end up losing it all or wasting it all and not not right. having anything to show for it, right. you know? And so it's so important to have this education and have this knowledge. And, you know, I personally love this conversation because more people need to face the demon that's called the tax guy <laughs> and just trust that there are people out there that can help you. Yeah. There's tons of tools out there. They're just obviously, you know, it's not that they're hidden, but they're not, they're not, since we're not learning about money in school or financial education, like who's going to teach us now a little bit more complex of these strategies, you know, yeah. Um, going through school and being like, okay, I'm going to be an accountant. It's like, yes, I learned about, you know, balancing books and all that stuff, but I think I took one tax class. That's it. Just one in my, in, in, in college. 
So all of this that I learned was yes, through, you know, doing taxes for over 20 years, but then I was like, you know what, something has to change. Um, and, but it was my, my whole uh, background in, in other finance and other stuff that I started to connect the dots because I thought it was just, you know, me and my background or because I was Hispanic that I am the only one with these problems. But it, it, it quickly, I quickly found out that that's not the case. So um, don't be afraid of your numbers. They're telling, they're trying to tell you a story. And by us ignoring it, sometimes we, it's too late. That's how businesses sometimes fail or we go in bankrupt or we use up all our savings and go into debt because we didn't take the time to really read those numbers and figure out what they're trying to tell us. Yeah. I was a part of a mastermind with um, other business owners, businesses that were making millions of dollars. Um, Cause I got through, I got in the mastermind through like a Tony Robbins event uh -huh. and uh, there was all these people that didn't know their numbers. Yes. They couldn't read their P and L they couldn't read like, you know, their profit, their profit and loss statements. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand their return on investment. They didn't understand what the difference was between. And I was just like, I'm over here. Like, this is all foreign to me, you know, and I don't even have a business that's making millions and millions of dollars. Like you're it's, making millions yeah. and millions of dollars. Yes, you know, you see that relation though. We think that it's because we're not making that kind of money, but you could be making that kind of money and you still won't know how to read your numbers. So we have to learn no matter how little we make or how much we make, it's important to read them because they're trying to tell us a story and we can help it grow, right? Because it, it helps with projections. It helps with preventing, you know, like a bankruptcy. But for me, it's like, let's work it so that we know our return on the investment on that Facebook ad you just did or the marketing team you just hired or the new equipment you just purchased. It's like, make your money back, your investment on that investment. But yeah. if you're not reading the numbers, you don't even know if you're making that money back or not. Exactly. And again, like anyone can start a business, but like she said, if you don't know your numbers, you may not succeed. And if you can have an idea and you can turn it into a business and let's hope and be magical that it, you have <laughs> all these customers, but if you want to continue your business, you've got to, you've got to like, look at the numbers. Yeah. And that was one of the big realizations in that mastermind is that there's so many people with these amazing ideas and great businesses, but because of old wounds about money, or I come from a different country, or that's just not, you know, they bury their heads. And they're just uh, kind of like, um, he, the guy that Keith Cunningham is the guy that runs the mastermind. Uh -huh. And he would say, you're just playing, paying dumb tax. Yeah. You're paying dumb tax. You're paying money. You're literally putting money in a trash can and burning it on fire because you don't know your numbers and That's you should dumb. know your numbers and you should know how to play the game. The reason the people at the, on the first, like the first top percent of or what, the 1% of America that is making the money because they know the numbers and they have good people that are hired in the positions to tell them what to do. And right. so, and the tax law changes every year, every year, there's a new tax law, or there's a new <laughs> loophole, or there's a new thing that, you know, that it's like, that's a second job. If you want to do it on your own, sure, take the time. Trust me, I tried to do it myself. Yeah. And it wasn't worth the time or the effort or the energy. Hire someone that is going to know the numbers is going to help you find the strategies mm -hmm. and use the tax code to your benefit. So yeah. then it's no longer a fear of yours, you know, yeah. like you said earlier, now your clients are excited to come see you on tax yeah. day. Yes, it's true. I mean, it was funny explaining to my dad what it is that we do for a living. Cause you know, he just like, Oh, they just do taxes. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but explaining it to him that we're different, that we, that we do strategy and all this stuff. And he would just like, the concept to him was just like, we work to pay taxes and, and whatever we get, like we make a living off of it. And I was like, no, dad, there's like cooler ways to do this, you know? Um, but it was, it was something that it's unheard of. And so if it's unheard of to, you know, like my dad that, you know, he doesn't know much about any other, like, you know, business, I thought, again, it was a me issue or an us issue. And yet when you talk to business owners, they have this great idea and they start to make money, but they don't know what how to keep their books. They don't know how important it is to keep their books. And that's why the IRS comes in and shuts them down because they're not paying sales tax, because they're not filing their reports, because they don't have records. And so 
this dream turns into a nightmare and that's what we're trying to prevent. It should not be. If you have a dream, whether you're working your, your dream W-2 job or not, there's so many strategies out there to help you keep more of your hard-earned money. You just have to find the right team or read the right books to, you know, to get the knowledge that you need. And what would you say to someone who is saying, well, you're trying to get away from not paying taxes? Look, I love this country and this country is built on taxes. So I'm not going to say that I don't like to pay taxes. Paying taxes means I make money, mm -hmm. but I only want to pay my fair share, right? Because at the end of the day, I can do more money. I, I'm sorry. I can do more with my money than this country will do with the money that I give them, right? Because right. it's lost in the shuffle. And we all complain about the potholes and the roads and be the, you know, whatever you complain about that taxes pays you know, I could turn around and I can use the money and give it to organizations that are going to do better with that money. But I yes. want to be the one to control that. Doesn't mean I don't want to pay my taxes. It just means I want to be able to do more with my own money and pay my fair share. And the more money I make, the more taxes I'm going to be taxed anyway. So it's not like I'm not paying taxes. It's just, there's a much better way to do so. And it'll help you grow because you can reinvest that money in yourself. Yeah, exactly. People don't understand the concept of how if you had more money, you would actually be part of the economy more. Right. And you'd probably be, like you said, donating money to certain franchises or certain mm -hmm. things. You'd be out there in the community. Like you don't need to pay more taxes. Like I said earlier in the podcast, you're already paying taxes as they're paying you. Yeah. And then as you buy more things, you're paying taxes <laughs> again. So then you're, you know what I mean? You're just constantly yeah. paying taxes. But if we were paying as, if we could, and I would love for one day the government to be audited the way yeah. we're audited. <laughs> Imagine where we would find like all these money, all this money, all this grant stuff that like people aren't tapping into simply because we don't know. Right. We don't know that there's allocated funds for this or grants available for that or this. You would be surprised at all the different availability of funds that are out there for you. Um, so anyways, as we wrap up this episode, what would be your nugget of wisdom for anyone who is listening, who may be a business owner, who may be wanting to start a business, who maybe just like has an idea and just is afraid, or maybe they're just like a regular corporate person yeah. and they've just never really taken the time to like look further into their taxes. So I, when you become one of my clients, I always tell them, read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. All right. It's just whether you're in real estate or not doesn't matter. It just it's a very easy read on the fundamentals of the self-employed versus the W-2 individuals. And either place that you are, it's great, right? But what it does talk about is, you know, being able to understand your numbers. Like we we can do more once we have a better understanding of how much money we made and where it's going. Um, the team that we need behind us, right? And working on ourselves. I've had a business coach since I started the, 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 the business because I kept saying like, I hate sales. I hate sales. And what it is, is us and our limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it has to do with the fact that I'm the oldest and I'm Hispanic where I come from. I don't know what it has to do with. I know all I know is that because my parents, you know, had this fear of losing their money. I have this fear of losing my money. And so I had to really break through those barriers I had to break through all the limiting beliefs that I had. Um, like I said, starting the business was a scary thing. Uh, but having my parents tell me on the other side, like, you know, but with your work, you have a, a secure paycheck and you're going to get paid every two weeks and having your own business, you don't know when you're going to get paid. Like those things, I, I know they said it from their heart, but it's not true. Um, you know, we've been very successful. I'm very proud of what we've, we've built and we have security. But it's a different type of security, security that makes others uncomfortable. And it's okay. It's yeah. really okay. So we're very happy for that. And um, anybody out there that has those hesitations, you know, have somebody that can guide you and advise you through the process or that has an outside perspective, right? Mm -hmm. um, that can That can help you and guide you is who you need to have in your corner. Yes, I love that. I truly believe that when you're ready to leave the village or your comfort zone, mm -hmm. you have to have someone outside of the village to tell you that there's the monsters aren't really real. 
and right. they're not going to get you. Right. Because like, when you look, like you said, when you're talking to your parents are like, no, 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 you can't <laughs> because they have never seen it. They, they themselves have never done it and they haven't seen anyone be successful at it. And so that's why they're so afraid. And they're only doing it because they love you and they care about you and they don't want to see you fail or get hurt. But in our failures is where we learn and grow and evolve. So, I mean, I'm so thankful that we had this conversation. Where can my audience find you? So we're very big on, very, very big on social media. I want to spread the message as much as possible. So you can find our Instagram is prominence.services or our website is prominencebusiness.com. Thank you again for listening to Journey of a Fearless Female. I'm your host, Paola Rosser. If you're looking for a life coach or a spiritual mentor, you can book a free discovery call with me at www.fearlessfemale.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at fearlessfemale underscore coach. Subscribe to my YouTube channel at fearlessfemale or find me on TikTok. I'm under at paola.rosser. And if you love this episode, make sure you hit subscribe, share it with your friends and leave a review. I read every single review and I truly appreciate the time you spend writing it.